Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, this evening is the fourth in our series of gender studies lectures this year. Um, the gender studies lecture series was designed to highlight research from faculty from across campus who teach as part of the gender studies program. Last fall, we heard from a sociologist, someone speaking on medieval literature, and someone speaking on biblical studies. That was me. <laughs> this spring, we're very privileged to have another English professor on theater arts. And in fact, if you're free next Tuesday evening, I'd like to take this time to plug our next gender studies lecture. Um, Dr. John Blundell will be speaking Tuesday evening in Porter Theater on um, I should have written it down. It's a really great topic and it'll be fabulous and it's connected to the plays that are running right now in the theater department. So please welcome you to come to that on Tuesday night. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Sarah Jarek uh, from the sociology department here at Westmont. Dr. Jarek graduated from a very prestigious university here on the West Coast, um, a private Christian liberal arts college called Westmont, <laughs> where she studied sociology. She went on to do a master's in social work and a PhD in sociology and social work at the University of Michigan. And she's returned to teach here in 2014. She researches in areas of trauma, post-traumatic growth, gendered violence, deviance, and other really fascinating and really difficult topics. So, we're very lucky to have her with us to walk us through this particular area tonight. She has published research on race, class, and gender and sexualities in Firefly. She also has published in more serious areas of social work with trauma and violence survivors. She's speaking tonight on narrative reconstruction and post-traumatic growth among trauma survivors, the importance of gender and cultural narratives. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jarek. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with each of you um, this evening. If someone asked you to tell them the story of your life, what would you say? What would you focus upon and why? How would you explain your life's trajectory from birth until now? Now imagine that you have experienced something really traumatic, and perhaps you have. Something such as a brutal physical assault that almost killed you, the suicide of your best friend, a rape by someone you trusted, a carjacking at gunpoint, or taking care of your mother as she slowly dies of a brain tumor. How might this change your life story, your understanding of who you are, of what life is all about? about how you view the future and how you live. This presentation is based upon research I conducted with undergraduate and graduate students, similar to many of you in this room, who have experienced these types of traumatic events and who shared with me their life stories or narratives. As both a sociologist and a social worker, I seek to better understand the micro, meso, and macro level forces that shape our lives. I also explore how helping professionals can more effectively assist vulnerable groups, such as trauma survivors, to experience healing, wholeness, and productive lives. The format I'm using for my talk tonight is similar to that of a conference presentation, where I'll introduce you to some of the concepts my research is based upon and in dialogue with, before walking you through an overview of the study and my findings. Unique among all species on Earth, human beings are storytellers. In fact, many researchers argue that the creation of narrative is a fundamental characteristic of being human, and that individual identity is formed through the telling, retelling, enacting, and reformulating of stories. There are individual, group, cultural, and societal narratives, and every known human culture has included storytelling as a central component. Theorists who study narrative posit that individuals do not merely internalize an objective external reality, but rather subjectively construct meaning from the raw material of their experiences. More than an individual process, 
The core structures of our sense-making apparatuses are shaped by the interplay of myriad biological, physiological, developmental, interpersonal, cultural, societal, and experiential variables. Narrative theorists assert that humans make sense of or create meaning from their lives by constructing credible, coherent accounts of the key events they encounter. This process is thought to be central to humans' identity-making processes. Individual autonomy, though, in constructing one's life narrative should not be overstated. Meaning is not constructed in a vacuum. Rather, individuals draw selectively from a range of discourses validated by their families, social groups, communities, and cultures. Thus, individuals' identities and life stories are perpetually shaped by historical, political, cultural, and social fac factors. In daily life, the individual continuously encounters new events and situations that may potentially reshape the story and thus the self and which either confirm or challenge the existing narrative. In most instances, our new experiences are smoothly incorporated into our life story with minimal disruption to the master narrative. However, unanticipated, incongruous events, such as trauma, may challenge the individual's ability to create a meaningful account of life events and may extre be extremely difficult to integrate into one's existing narrative. Researchers have long documented that people coping with a wide variety of negative life events, ranging from cancer to the Holocaust, seem compelled to make sense of the incident or find meaning in their experience. Robert Niemeyer uses a narrative constructivist metaphor to explain this phenomenon. Like a novel that loses a central character in the middle chapters, the life story disrupted by loss must be rewritten to find a new strand of continuity that bridges the past with the future in an intelligible fashion. Researchers have documented that higher levels of narrative coherence are associated with decreased symptoms of post-traumatic stress, as well as with positive trauma recovery and increased general well-being. Now, as we're all undoubtedly aware, traumatic life events have a significant impact on individuals' lives events ranging from natural disasters to war trauma, from severe motor vehicle accidents to sexual assault, affect survivors' lives in myriad ways. Literally thousands of studies have documented and explored trauma's wide-ranging effects on people physically, emotionally, relationally, psychologically, spiritually, and behaviorally. Despite this overwhelming focus upon the negative effects of trauma, there is another side to the story the positive outcomes that may result from negative life events. The general concept of good emerging from the midst of tragedy is a timeless theme. However, it is only in the past two decades or so that researchers have begun to systematically examine the various positive outcomes that may arise within the context of adversity. Post-traumatic growth is a construct first put forward by Tedeschi and Calhoun in 1996 and they define it as the positive changes that an individual may experience as a result of the struggle with a major loss or trauma. It involves the positive development of individuals beyond their previous level of adaptation, psychological functioning, or life awareness. Using factor analysis, Tedeschi and Calhoun have identified five major domains of growth. A greater appreciation of life and changed sense of priorities, warmer, more intimate relationships with others, a greater sense of personal strength, recognition of new possibilities or paths for one's life, and spiritual development. Post-traumatic growth has been documented among many population groups, ranging from survivors of natural disasters to the loved ones of murder victims. However, many questions remain unanswered in this nascent field. Those of you who have taken one or more sociology courses are likely familiar with the concepts such as social norms or the rules of behavior shape, sh shared by members of a culture or society. There are many types of norms, ranging from rules of etiquette to laws regarding criminal events. The, law, the norms that I'm going to focus on tonight are gender norms, which shape so many aspects of our life. 
including our posture while sitting, our manner of dress and self-presentation, the types of work and leisure activities we're likely to engage in, and how we think about ourselves, our place in the world, and so much more. Hegemonic masculinity is a concept popularized by R.W. Connell in the late 1980s that refers to the culturally idealized and normative form of manhood, as well as the gender hierarchy in which one type of masculinity is dominantly positioned in comparison to other subordinated forms of masculinity and all forms of femininity. This cultural ideal is embodied by white, heterosexual, able-bodied, middle to upper class men who display attributes such as aggressiveness, toughness, stoicism, competitiveness, and heterosexual prowess. Hegemonic masculinity is usually discussed in terms of how it advantages a subset of men over other men and over all women, or about how some men, including men of color and gay men, are subordinated to the more dominant group. Less often is hegemonic masculinity discussed in terms of how it places constraints upon all men, including those who are at the top of the masculine pecking order. Some gender scholars assert that hegemonic masculinity encourages all men to live their lives within a, live their lives within a metaphorical box. In many social contexts, if a boy or a man steps outside of this narrow range of acceptable behaviors, attitudes, or emotional displays, he is subjected to ridicule or even physical violence. Unless willing to face the negative consequences, boys and men are taught, encouraged, and even coerced into conforming themselves as closely as possible to the unattainable cultural ideal of hegemonic masculinity. Now to summarize this background section of my talk, a traumatic life event throws a significant plot twist into one's life story, threatens the narrative coherence of that story, challenges one's sense of identity, initiates what some scholars call a crisis of meanings, and may shatter assumptions about how the world works and one's place within it. Trauma survivors must thus come to terms with their disrupted life narratives, but they do not do so in a vacuum. Rather, a variety of factors, including, I argue, our communities, our culture, and our gendered expectations of one another, influence trauma survivors' narrative reconstruction efforts. Paradoxically, trauma also provides individuals with an opportunity to revise their life narratives in positive ways, redefine their identities and social roles, develop more realistic and less shatter-prone schemas about the world, and experience personal transformation and post-traumatic growth. I had three primary research questions for this study. First, how and to what degree do trauma survivors reconstruct a coherent life narrative? Second, what is the relationship between trauma survivors' narrative reconstruction and their development of post-traumatic growth? And third, what factors significantly shape trauma survivors' life narratives? The relationship between trauma survivors' reconstruction of a coherent life narrative and their development of post-traumatic growth has rarely been examined through empirical research. This study is a part of a larger research project, which includes both qualitative and quantitative data. My talk tonight will primarily focus upon the qualitative data. I conducted in-depth, semi-structured life story interviews with and administered six survey instruments to 46 undergraduate and graduate students at a large public Midwestern university. You can see the eligibility criteria here. Students were eligible to participate if they were between 18 and 30 years of age, had experienced one or more traumatic events that had ended, felt that they had grown personally or benefited from the trauma, and felt that they were ready to discuss their experiences and their impact. Once eligibility was ascertained, I met with each participant twice. First, for approximately one hour to administer surveys and establish rapport and second to conduct the interview. Interviews averaged just over two hours in length and generally consisted of four sections. An overview of interviewee's life story and major life events, 
questions regarding interviewees' traumatic experiences, their impact, and how they coped with the trauma, an exploration of interviewees' post-traumatic growth, and a wrap-up section that included questions regarding interviewees' future plans and additional topics that they thought were relevant. All names used tonight in this presentation are pseudonyms, and potentially identifiable details regarding interviewees have been removed or obscured. As you can see, both on this slide and on table one of your handout, this sample is diverse with regard to race or ethnicity, with almost 40% of the research participants identifying themselves as non-Caucasian. The sample includes more women than men. 65% of research participants were in their junior or senior years of college or had just graduated, and 20% were graduate students. Their average age among all respondents was 21 and a half years. There is some diversity in socioeconomic status, but I would say this is a relatively affluent sample overall. The average number of traumatic life events per person is 2.6. 46% of the research participants have experienced a single traumatic life event, and a third of them have experienced three or more traumatic events. The most common types of trauma experienced by this sample was the sudden or premature death of a parent, sibling, or friend, most frequently due to cancer, an accident, murder, or suicide. The second most common form of trauma was sexual assault. And the third most common type of trauma was some form of serious injury to the research participant, including their own suicide attempts or a medical crisis in their own life. Data analysis involved a combination of thematic and structural narrative analysis. Rather than fracturing individual interviewees' accounts into thematic categories, I interpreted each life story as a whole and made comparisons across cases, looking for similarities and differences regarding topics gleaned from the existing literatures on narrative, trauma recovery, and post-traumatic growth. I paid careful attention to the ways in which the personal linked with the political, particularly with respect to interviewees' references to dominant discourses to systematically examine the relationship between trauma, excuse me, um, to systematically um, look at the relationship between trauma survivors' reconstruction of coherent life narratives and their development of post-traumatic growth, I categorized each interviewee with regard to the coherence of their narrative and the level of their post-traumatic growth. Based upon the literature on post-traumatic growth, and an in-depth analysis of exemplars in my data, I identified three major characteristics of trauma survivors who exhibit high levels of post-traumatic growth. First, the individual has experienced positive life changes across a vast breadth of life domains. Second, the individual has experienced positive post-trauma life changes to a great depth or degree in those life domains. And third, the individual perceives the positive, positive post-trauma life changes as significant and meaningful in their life. Based upon the research literature on life stories and an in-depth analysis of exemplars in my data, I identified five major components of highly coherent post-trauma narratives. First, the narrator articulates a continuous and detailed storyline without constant prompting regarding her or his life before, during, and after the trauma. Second, the narrator's life story is intelligible, organized, and logical. In other words, it makes sense. Third, the narrator articulates a clear sense of self before and after the trauma, aware of both the continuity and change of the self. Fourth, the narrator has incorporated the trauma into her or his worldview or belief system. And fifth, the narrator has incorporated the trauma into her or his vision of the future. So using these characteristics and components as a guide, I repeatedly listened to interview audio files and read the transcripts and my own field notes in order to categorize research participants as experiencing low, moderate, or high post-traumatic growth and their life stories as having low, moderate, or high narrative coherence. My primary finding is that developing 
a coherent life narrative is positively associated with post-traumatic growth. To demonstrate this relationship, I'm going to present a typology consisting of three categories. Level one includes survivors exhibiting low narrative coherence and low post-traumatic growth. Level two includes survivors displaying moderate narrative coherence and moderate post-traumatic growth. And level three includes survivors demonstrating high narrative coherence and high post-traumatic growth. To illustrate the characteristics of each, lever, of each level, I will present a case study of one exemplar from level one and level three, highlighting aspects of their case that are representative of the category as a whole. While not generalizable, approximately 11% of the trauma survivors in this sample are best categorized as level one, half the sample as level two, and 33% as level three. Seven percent of the sample, so that's three people, did not fit neatly into any category. Table two on your handout contains a breakdown of demographic and trauma-related variables by level. So level one, I'm gonna to talk to you about Mike. Mike is an 18-year-old Caucasian student who had a, quote, normal relationship with his parents growing up. During high school, however, his family life became erratic. After a bout with cancer, Mike's father became angry, drank heavily, and was harshly critical of Mike. The major trauma in Mike's life occurred during his junior year of high school, when his sister disappeared after she attended a sailboat race. Three days later, her body was found in the water. Numerous questions surrounding her death remain unanswered to this day. Mike imagines that she may have drowned accidentally, but he also suspects that she may have been killed by a man she was dating. Since his sister's death, Mike has struggled to cope with some emotions, primarily anger. Mike has never seen a helping professional and he neither feels the need nor desire to discuss his loss. Mike states, quote, I guess the person who brings her, his deceased sister, up the most is Tammy, his remaining sister. Whenever I'm alone with Tammy, she always has something to say about her, and it just surprises me that she always wants to talk about it or is able to talk about it. I just feel like I'm the one who wants nothing to say about it. Forget about it. Mike holds his pain inside and does not seek meaning in these events. In my field notes, I observed, quote, he clearly has not dealt with things very directly at all, and I felt like I was pulling teeth to make him talk. He just struggled for words, really awkward, difficult interview. As a result of not forming a coherent narrative about his life, including his sister's death, Mike's trauma remains nearly as raw and unprocessed today as it was two years ago. Despite volunteering for a study on post-traumatic growth, Mike acknowledges that he has not grown to a great degree in any area of his life thus far. Mike believes that the most important aspect of his personal growth is the fact that he has, quote, handled the difficult experiences in his life. He explains, quote, I'm still moving on, continuing on. So I'd say it's made it clear that I can keep trucking. Asked how he has managed to continue on with his life, Mike responded, quote, really just not stopping long enough to give myself too much time to think about it. Mike may still be trucking, but his worldview has become one of cynical resignation, summed up by his declaration, quote, Life does suck. When asked how he would ideally have handled this traumatic experience, Mike replied, quote, I'd have to understand that that's the way life works, I guess. Um, basically try to get over it. Suppress it, I guess. That doesn't seem very healthy. I don't know. There's nothing I can do about it, so? As the above quotes demonstrate, Mike's basic philosophy, and I'm using his words um, in a lot of this, his philosophy on moving on after trauma is that one must adjust their thinking to incorporate the facts that life does suck and that that's the way life works. Suppress one's feelings so that one can try to get over it and then keep going on with regular life to avoid having too much time to think about it. Yet, even as he articulates this formula, Mike is not convinced that it will work. Hence, one must try to get over it. Or that this approach is, quote, very healthy, perhaps recognizing that these strategies have fallen short in his own life thus far. 
To summarize, level one trauma survivors, like Mike, have not developed a coherent life narrative. They may know who they were before the trauma, but they frequently do not know who they, were, who they are afterward. They have difficulty articulating what has happened to them and to their lives, or how it changed them positively and negatively. They usually realize that they've lost something big, but they do not recognize any gain from the experience. They have difficulty grieving their losses and moving forward. They sound stuck, immobile, and at a loss for words. They are left with a worldview that is either depressingly cynical or completely in shambles. They're, they may not know what to believe about the world, themselves, and others. They have a bleak or unformed vision of their future, little sense of direction, and few future plans. They are often simply trying to survive their current day-to-day -day life. They have difficulty investing in others' lives because they lack extra emotional energy to give to others. They exhibit, li they exhibit little post-traumatic growth in any area of their life. In some, they seem lost. Now, on the other end of the spectrum are level three survivors. I'm gonna tell you about Jennifer. Jennifer is a 23-year-old Asian woman whose family moved frequently due to her father's work. The major traumas in Jennifer's pre-adolescence included being robbed and carjacked at gunpoint, two incidents of inappropriate sexual touching, significant corporal punishment, and a home invasion and armed robbery at gunpoint. When Jennifer was 12 years old, her mother had a stroke that left her unconscious for several weeks. A few months later, Jennifer's father had a heart attack that nearly killed him. With both parents incapacitated as a 12-year-old, Jennifer became the primary caregiver to her mother, father, and sister. She became, quote, less of a kid, more responsible, serious, mature, and focused. Jennifer quickly learned to manage the family's banking, insurance, mortgage, and healthcare issues, in addition to innumerable ordinary household tasks. Jennifer and her family moved to the US when she was 16 years old. She struggled to learn English, worked several part-time jobs, and continued caring for her parents. During her senior year of high school, Jennifer started breaking down. A psychologist identified her as being overworked and suffering from depression and anxiety. In college, Jennifer found a counselor who helped her to reduce work responsibilities, focus more time on academics, and improve her self-care. Jennifer feels that she's experienced substantial post-traumatic growth. Recognizing that the future is uncertain, Jennifer tries to live each day with purpose and to interact with others such that she will not have regrets. Her growth is evidenced in her increased closeness with her family, her enjoyment of life's little moments, her regular expressions of love toward those closest to her, and her efforts to be kind to everyone. Additionally, Jennifer's experiences have taught her that she's able to overcome much more than she would have ever thought possible. Jennifer's adversity has also helped her to develop a clear vision of the future. Jennifer plans to become a medical missionary, working on international public health issues, helping the underprivileged and giving people hope. The most prominent theme in Jennifer's life story is her Christian belief system. When asked how she made it through the adversity she faced. Jennifer said, quote, I know that God loves me no matter what I'm going through and that he's gonna be always there for me, that he's gonna be my strength. Not only has Jennifer's faith helped her to feel loved and supported during the roughest times in her life, but it has also provided her with a way to create meaning amidst adversity. Jennifer explains, quote, I always thought maybe there's something I can take out of this, and maybe he's preparing me to be a stronger person for other people. Maybe because I went through this and I understand better, I can help others and I can be there for them, you know? So I just thought God is making me stronger and just probably he has something great in store for me because I went through so many things. Jennifer looks for something positive that she can take from her experiences, believing that God allowed adversity into her life for a reason. Her belief system enables her to make sense of traumatic events, to construct a life narrative for herself that incorporates these incidents into a coherent story, and to find a meaningful purpose for her life post-trauma. 
In short, Jennifer's religious beliefs help her to form a cohesive master narrative for her life. So to summarize, level three trauma survivors like Jennifer have a highly coherent life narrative. They know who they were prior to the trauma, how the trauma changed them positively and negatively, and who they are afterward. The individual's identity before and after the trauma has continuity in many ways and is different in other ways. These trauma survivors know what they have gained and what they have lost. They appreciate the gains, grieve the losses, and move forward with their life. They have adjusted their worldview as necessary to accommodate their new understanding of the world, a worldview that is neither naive nor depressingly cynical and can incorporate traumatic events. They have a hopeful vision for the future, a sense of direction, and their future plans are often tied in some way to the trauma. Frequently, they develop what Judith Herman refers to as a survivor mission, where they choose to devote their lives to helping other people who've been through similar experiences. Level three trauma survivors exhibit high levels of post-traumatic growth throughout many areas of their lives. Due to time constraints, I'm not going to share with you an exemplar from level two, but here's kind of an overview. Level two trauma survivors fall somewhere in the middle of the spectrum on both narrative coherence and post-traumatic growth. In general, level two trauma survivors are in the process of forming a coherent life narrative, but they've not fully accomplished this. They may struggle with understanding who they are after the trauma and where their life is going. They may have difficulty grieving their losses or recognizing their gains. Their worldview may not make much sense, or they may still be working through lots of questions about their belief system. They usually recognize that they're moving forward, but they readily acknowledge that they're in the midst of a process of change. They may oscillate between feeling focused and strong and feeling vulnerable, confused, and rudderless. Level two survivors demonstrate a moderate level of post-traumatic growth in several areas of their lives. In sum, their stories are complex, partially unformed, frequently contradictory, and definitely a work in progress. In addition to this typology, which serves as a useful analytical device to examine the key characteristics of various stages of post-trauma change, I also found that there are several factors that significantly shape trauma survivors' life narratives and their efforts to reconstruct a coherent post-trauma life story. These factors include these seven, cultural narratives, collective traumas, gender, trauma-related therapy, writing about the trauma, informal conversations regarding the trauma, um, as well as self-reflection. While the latter four factors do play important roles in narrative coherence and the narrative reconstruction process for many survivors, tonight I'm gonna to focus on the first three factors with the remainder of my time. <clears throat> the present day US is a society filled with pre-existing narratives that are widely available and readily understood. In what Ruth Frankenberg refers to as the discursive environment, there are numerous extant discourses or cultural narratives that individuals can draw upon when constructing their identities and life stories. Specific cultural narratives share numerous characteristics, including major characters, story arc, tone, themes, and resolution. Cultural narratives and the discursive environment not only influence what we say about our life stories, they also shape how we think about our life narratives and about ourselves, and thus about how we act. Some trauma survivors can connect their experiences to a larger cultural narrative. For example, Jennifer draws heavily upon Christianity, which provides her with a positive life philosophy comfort and confidence in difficult times, a framework within which to understand and give meaning to her experiences, and a ready-made script regarding how she should respond to adversity. In short, this cultural narrative buffers Jennifer from the ontological threat of having her pre-trauma assumptions about the world shattered, while also providing a shortcut of sorts in her process of reconstructing a coherent post-trauma life story. 
Some traumatic events are experienced collectively to some degree by a society. Shortly after such events, a cultural narrative evolves. For example, in the days following the attacks of September 11, 2001, Carrie, a level two survivor of that trauma, compared her personal experiences, her feelings and interpretations regarding that day with those of other survivors in her social network. She also incorporated components she later learned through media coverage into her own account. In short, the cultural narratives that emerge from large-scale collective traumas assist individual survivors in reconstructing a coherent life narrative. Similarly, some traumas are experienced collectively, but on a smaller scale, by a group or a community. This, too, may prompt the development of a collective narrative. For example, Aubrey, who experienced multiple traumas, describes the period shortly after her boyfriend was murdered as follows. Quote, the school was really impacted, and they even had like a big lounge at school the next day for people to just go to if they needed time to reflect or, you know, talk about it. And I was, of course, a mess. But it didn't take as long to heal from that compared to another trauma she later experienced because I was experiencing it collectively. You know, with a lot of my friends who knew him as well, and we kind of coped together. I mean, it was tough, but like I said, we kind of healed together. As Aubrey's account illustrates, traumatic events experienced as a group often spark collective coping activities, such as talking about the trauma, expressing emotions, and grieving together. While not necessarily tied to a cultural narrative, smaller scale collective traumas may nonetheless generate what I call subcultural narratives, or narratives, group narratives within a given context. Now, although there is an array of readily available cultural narratives within the discursive environment, not all narratives are equally valued or encouraged in a society. In fact, some stories and some examples are the narratives regarding male rape victims or being transgender or regretting one's abortion have little to no accepted place in the discursive environment currently, are not validated or are strongly discouraged. Moreover, not every member of a society has equal access to all available cultural narratives. Rather, the presence or absence of narratives in the discursive environment the reception these stories receive within society, and the access that individuals have to these narratives is influenced by the historical moment, social norms, politics, power, privilege, and individuals' locations in the social structure. I am turning now to the final factor that I'll be discussing tonight, gender. Quantitatively, a three-category typology with this sample size, especially with so few people in level one, makes it very difficult to obtain statistically significant results regarding group-based differences. I did use a variety of inferential statistics to determine if there were statistically significant demographic and trauma-related differences between the survivors in those three categories. Several relationships approach statistical significance, but none achieve it. Thus, definitive quantitative conclusions regarding the relationships between these three different levels and various variables are simply not possible without a larger sample. However, if you look at table two, which is in your handout, there is an interesting gender difference that I think is worth exploring in future research. Look at the gender breakdown in levels one, two, and three. Now, keeping in mind that this sample is approximately 60% female and 40, or 60% female and 40% male, if gender had nothing to do with narrative reconstruction and post-traumatic growth, we would expect to see this same 60-40 breakdown in each level. It's there in level three, that top row. But gender differences appear in level two and then are more pronounced in level one, where 7% of the total women in the sample, but 17% of the total men in the sample are in level one, the level with low narrative coherence and low post-traumatic growth. I also noticed a similar pattern in the qualitative data. Here's what I think is going on, and I'll use the example of Mike first. 
Mike does not have a readily accessible cultural narrative upon which to base his post-trauma life story. As a member of several socially privileged groups, as a white heterosexual male, Mike has been socialized into the norms of hegemonic masculinity, in which men are taught to not express vulnerability, exhibit few emotions other than anger, and handle all of their own problems without the assistance of others. Moreover, the sudden death of a sibling, particularly during one's adolescence, is a relatively uncommon form of trauma, and such stories do not have a prominent place in our culture's current discursive environment. There is thus no extant cultural narrative, complete with a story arc, philosophy of life, and norms regarding how to live one's life going forward, for Mike to adopt as his own. Mike also does not subscribe to the tenets of any particular religion or philosophical creed that might facilitate his efforts to find meaning in his sister's death. Subsequently, to a large extent, Mike is on his own with regard to trying to make sense of his traumatic loss and reconstructing his life narrative. So far, he has been largely unsuccessful in doing so. There are many ways in which men have greater privilege, power, and opportunities vis-a-vis -vis women in contemporary US society and around the world. However, when it comes to processing traumatic experiences, reconstructing one's life narrative post-trauma, and developing post-traumatic growth, these data and others suggest that women may have a slight advantage. Current gender norms allow women greater freedom in expressing vulnerability and pain, exhibiting emotions other than anger, both verbally and in writing, and seeking support from friends, family members, and therapists, which are all factors that were important. Those tied in with factors on four through seven in an earlier slide of mine. They're all factors that help trauma survivors reconstruct their life narratives and develop post-traumatic growth. So my research suggests that hegemonic masculinity limits the types of narratives that men can construct about their lives, the cultural narratives available for them to draw upon, and consequently their ability to process traumatic experiences, heal, develop post-traumatic growth, and move on positively with their lives. There are several implications of my research. On the applied side, helping professionals should continue to assist survivors to put their traumatic experiences into words, whether orally or in writing, to integrate the trauma into their life story, to articulate their identity before and after the trauma, to identify the continuity and differences between those iterations of the self, to grieve the losses and commemorate any growth achieved, and to reconstruct a narrative that affirms the positive aspects of the self while also creating meaning in life and a hopeful vision for the future. Traditional talk therapy is not the only route to narrative coherence, trauma recovery, and post-traumatic growth. Therefore, practitioners should continue to develop creative techniques, whether that's writing a blog, creating a video, engaging in sport activities, or many other types of creative approaches that may appeal to diverse populations, including men. Additionally, clinicians should encourage trauma survivors to engage in informal conversations, self-reflection, and writing about their story. The primary implications of this research for researchers is that gathering and interpreting narrative data illuminates which narratives are validated by a culture in which narratives are absent, discouraged, or rejected. As disciplines that value social justice, groups that are marginalized, and voices that are stifled or disregarded by society, it is of paramount importance that sociologists and social workers alike pay attention to narrative gaps and silences, the unpopular narratives, and the narratives of the disenfranchised. As I discussed at the beginning of my talk, all of us reconstruct our life stories in the wake of unexpected or traumatic events. However, we do not reconstruct our narratives in a vacuum. Rather, our communities, the various cultures of which we are a part, and our gendered expectations for one another influence our narrative reconstruction efforts. 
We each are shaped by the cultures and subcultures in which we live. But our various choices and actions serve to either maintain the existing order and social structures or to challenge and even change them. Therefore, all of us, individually and collectively, play a role in facilitating trauma survivors' healing and growth processes. My hope is that we will all work diligently to open up spaces for the less welcome stories in our current cultural milieu, including those that challenge existing gender norms and validate these less commonly heard narratives as they emerge. This is an important step toward empowerment, social justice, and social change. Nurturing such narratives will allow men and women to express more of their humanity as well as to process traumatic experiences, reconstruct their life narratives, develop post-traumatic growth, and move on positively with their lives. Thank you.